but they must jump. In answer to our need, we think we've come up with the automobile they want. We like to sell them one. This is off the record. It wasn't easy. As a matter of fact, it took us 10 years to go from idea to reality. Actually, the first actual car can honestly be said to have 10 years of careful research and experimentation behind it. Henry Ford II originated the idea of Ford Motor Company building another car in the medium sized field. That was in 1948. In 1949, we made the first presentation of a proposal to the executive committee. At that time, we referred to the car not as the Echo, but as the intermediate car. The same year, we got approval to go ahead and we began the science. The car was already running well in terms of ordinary engineering when the Korean War held up its program. But we went right on with research. In the fall of 1954, we made a second presentation to the executive committee. Again, got approval. And we were on our way to what we then called the econ program. The board of directors established the special science division on April 15, 1955. In the following two years, we completed studies and engineering. Today, we show to an organization of almost 1,500 people, and we're in business. The introduction of the actual car now represents to the Ford Motor Company an investment of $250 million. Why invest this money in a new car? The fact is that Ford has a real sense of responsibility in being part of America today. We're part of it now. And we want to be a part of the growth and potential that lies ahead in this great country of ours. Now I realize that as automobile men, your primary consideration is what you can sell right now, not what you'll be selling 10 years from now. But any sensible man likes to look ahead. He wants to know what kind of security the future holds for him and his family. The future looks awfully good to us. In 1945, there were some 140 million Americans. Ten years later, there were 165 million. Since the last successful introduction of a new automobile in 1938, the Mercury, 65 million Americans have been born. By 1965, the American population will total approximately 190 million. And this means more automobiles. Putting together this growth in terms of people with economic growth, you particularly see the significance of things to come in America. Back in 1945, we had a gross national product, just over $250 billion. Gross national product, as you know, is a measure of total productivity in America. By 1955, we had grown to $375 billion. In 1956, we were well over $400 billion. And this year, we are running along at a rate of around $427 billion. By 1965, even the most conservative indications are that we will have a gross national product that's somewhere around $535 billion. When you add that to growth in terms of people, it again means more automobiles. In 1955, we had the biggest year in the industry. America spent $19 billion for new automobiles. Yet, when you compare this with what is going to happen in 1965, it becomes small. By 1965, we estimate it will be some $26 billion because there will be more people with more economic resources to buy more automobiles. These basic economic factors indicate briefly and simply why Ford Motor Company wants to be an important part of the growth of this industry. Back in 1945, there were 26 million cars on the road. That was considered the absolute limit. Yet the industry doubled its own population, 50 million cars by 1956, and we're still growing. By 1965, there will be some 70 million cars on the road in America. The potential owners of these cars are here in America today. In addition, the great movement to suburbia has made the automobile an essential part of our living and created the need for a second car, a power that was unheard of and unthought of 15 or 20 years ago. It is this tremendous growth in people and economics and the importance of the automobile in American living today that is the one important reason the Ford Motor Company is embarking on this program of introducing a new car to the motoring public. You are all familiar with the structure of the automobile market. In the low price field, there are three principal makes. One for Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler. We have about the same number of models as the Chevrolet and Plymouth, and we each have about the same number of dealers. 
when you have someone who really is like one, it becomes an entirely different company. Ford Motor Company has only one car, the Mercury. John Motors has three. Audi has an old Mercury commercial with Buick. Chrysler has its three. Dodge, DeSoto, and Chrysler. The deficiency in the market is evident for the Ford Motor Company. In the high price scale, the pattern very much like the low exists. Each of us has a price, and we each sell through about the same number of dealers. The big gap is in the medium price field, and because of this lack of equal participation within the medium price market, Ford Motor Company has been predominantly a low price car producer. For example, 90% of our buyers are the Ford car, and 20% of our sales are in the other market. This is a sharp contrast to General Motors, where 50% of their business is with the Chevrolet and 50% with the cars in the medium and high price field. About the same pattern exists for Chrysler. Ford Motor Company needs another product in the medium price field to compete effectively in the growing and evolving automobile market. This is particularly important when you examine what is happening in the medium price area. Today, as we're through doing 56, 55, and 54, over 60% of the sales in the automotive market have been in this medium price area. The 60% represents not only the sales of cars that are traditionally in this area, but also the sales of products in the low price field, which are actually priced in the medium area. For example, the upper lines of Ford Fairlane, the Chevrolet Bel-Air, and Plymouth Belvedere. The automobile market is a churning, moving market. About 40% of the new car market each year is made up of individuals who are changing mix. They may be moving from one market to another or changing mix in the same market. But whatever the reason, they are making a change in product ownership. The real significant aspect of this pattern to us is what happens particularly to people who own cars in the low price field. We would like to have the young man entering his first job buy a Ford used car. Then as he gets established, we want him to move on and buy a new Ford car. As this same fellow moves along in life, he will be among those who move into a car in the medium price field. Here again, we want him to stay with a Ford Motor Company car. Today, we have only the Mercury in this price field. Those who find higher success in life move into the prestige field. We want these people to own a Lincoln. That is the ideal path. Actually, it does not occur. And the reasons it does not occur are real, significant, and important to all of us. And the job we are doing is bringing out the answer. Here is what happens. If you look at the ownership of some 50 vintage cars in the world today, you will find about the same number of Chevrolets and Ford. But what happens to these owners as they tend to buy up into the medium price field? The Ford owner has only one product to move up to in the medium price field, the Mercury. The owner of a Chevrolet car can stay in the General Motors family by moving into a Pontiac, Oldsmobile, or Buick. Why do people move up from a Ford or Chevrolet to a medium price car? They move up because they want a car in an area of the market where they have an opportunity to express more individuality. General Motors is able to give them a choice of purchase, which we cannot with only one product. Here is a startling thing that happens. Of the Chevrolet owners who buy up into the medium price field, 75% of them stay with the General Motors Corporation family of cars. This is in contrast to the pattern in Ford, where only 26% of our graduating Ford owners stay with us and buy Mercury. And the real clincher is that those who do not stay in the Ford family move over and buy a General Motors car in the medium price field. This again indicates the reason for the excellence and the great potential which exists for this new car of ours in the medium price field. One big job we have done in the Excel division in the last two years has been to take a full look at the individual we call customer. In developing a new car and marketing it, we had to know a lot about this fellow. What makes him tick? Particularly, why does he buy cars in the medium price field? Why does he buy the particular mix he buys? How strongly does he feel about it? What causes him to make the decisions he makes? How is he going to feel and react to buying a new car, a new make on the market? All of these things are important to us. They're difficult things to get a hold of. 
because many of them are going to be telling people about psychological and medical cases. But I'm not really stepping into his mind and finding out what a lot of it is. We wanted to find out how people felt about the competitive nature of the meat of Christ's teaching. We asked them many questions, and we probed many ways. We found out such things as to which meat the food of the old meat and which the new meat, which are like best by women. How are the meats associated with income and job status? How do people think of the various kinds in terms of appearance, workmanship, trading value, performance, and so forth? From this mass of data and knowledge of competitive cars, we were able to frame the requirements for the input to achieve the objectives established for the car. The objectives of the Ultra car could be summarized briefly. To get rigorous coverage of the medium price market for Ford Motor Company. To ensure greater retention of the Ford F grades who move up every year to the medium price field. Keep more people in the Ford family. Greater retention in terms of corporate loyalty. To have more dealers selling more products made by Ford. Now with these objectives and knowledge of the competitive market, and these reactions and desires of the buying public, what kind of product could the intro be? We asked ourselves this question over two years ago because we wanted to determine and establish the kind of product that would do the job and do it most effectively. Here is the definition we established for the intro car. The intro should be the smart car, the smart car for growing America. It's not just words. It's a great definition in terms of what it is meant to work in carrying the program forward. To achieve this purpose, the intro had to be distinctive in appearance. It had to be different, yet not radically different. It had to have discreet appointment. It had to have graceful style. We're convinced that most people like clean, flowing lines and designs. It had to have advanced features. It had to be fully competitive in the highly competitive market. We think we have achieved these goals. For all of us who have part of the planning and development of the intro, this is really a historic moment. We're turning over to you the retail sales organization, 10 years of our lives. We're convinced that you will do the job in achieving a fair share of market for the intro car. That gentleman is the story behind 